after all the talk about music royalties and copyright, most of you may be wondering, do say you even earn anything as solo artists, bands or say you units? They do. Actually, they manage to earn a bit of money on complementary activities to their singing, especially complementing CD sales. And because not everything is about their music, for this episode I'll give you an in-depth look at what makes being an artist sustainable for Seiyu. Let's kick off this episode of Seiyu Lounge. Welcome to Seiyu Lounge, I am your host Vanessa and today's topic is How do Seiyu make money as artists? How do Seiyu make money as artists? Is a pertinent question, especially after we've talked about music royalties for 5 straight episodes. Many of you wonder how much money your favorite voice actor earns. Truth be told, unless they disclose it, you'll never know for certain. However, you can have some estimates, especially if you know how much anime, games and narration pay voice actors, something that I talked about on episode 8. You can also have an estimate if you have a grasp about how much is made with their music if you know your way around music royalties and take some time to study those booklets that come with physical editions of your favorite Seiyu's CDs. Like I've mentioned on episode 8, many fans of Seiyu wonder if their favorites actually earn enough to live a good life, especially after many Seiyu went through hell and back to have a shot at being voice actors. There are of course Seiyu that earn a lot of money. For example, Koichi Yamadera, Tomokazu Sugita and Hiroshi Kamiya are three of the best paid Seiyu on anime, narration and dubbing fees alone. Then you have Mamoru Miyano and Soma Saito on the music side that make quite the big figures with each CD they release. However, not many Seiyu artists can say that they earn a lot of money with their music. However, there are other ways to make their music careers sustainable and thus earn enough money that can cover for losses in CD sales or exponentially increase their profit with said sales. Since this episode is about Seiyu artists, let's analyze everything through that prism. So how do Seiyu artists make money? The classic way is, of course, by selling CDs. Adding to that is streaming. These are the primary ways through which Seiyu artists nowadays make money. But after the last couple of episodes you may already have an idea of how important or not those are and how little streaming pays while CDs are the biggest money maker for Seiyu artists. Of course, if they happen to have consistent sales numbers. However, music can be pirated, and thus Seiyu artists lose quite a lot of money in CD sales to piracy. So how to make sure that they cover for those expected losses? They tie up other activities to their music careers to complement their earnings and make up for the losses. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? And that's because it is. When you read that say you are launching their clothing brands or creating clothing based off of their music or seem like they are always on tour, it's just the common thing say you do to ensure that, by the end of the day, they earn the money they deserve as artists. What are some of those common things? Let's explore them a little bit. Performing music live. We're living in an era in which digital music is king. You have it available for free on streaming platforms and music videos are available on YouTube to watch whenever you want. 
Nowadays, music is extremely easy to access. And what has that created? Most music listeners don't bother with purchasing CDs or merchandise of any kind. However, they may be inclined to watch an artist perform live in what we call an intimate experience. I never thought it would come a day when I would have to say that going to a live show was an intimate experience, yet here we are. For those of you that, like myself, enjoy attending live shows and go to music festivals in the summer, you know well enough that there's nothing intimate about live shows. Yes, the artist is performing for their fans, but it doesn't sound intimate, just an extra experience on top of the albums of theirs you've listened to. But yeah, for music listeners that are all about the digital, getting music for cheap or really for free, a live show sounds like a premium experience because they have to pay for that intimate time with their favorite artists. Tours have been the go-to for artists for ages, but in the last decade have started to be more prominent, with artists going for long tours nationwide or even internationally. That's the general status of the music industry. Now let's go micro and see how things are in Japan for seiyuu artists. Live tours and live shows are an essential part of being an artist in Japan. However, for seiyuu artists, this was something that only started to make sense in the past decade. Why is that? Up until the last decade, seiyuu artists released music catering to their fans, more as a thank you or a gift, rather than a serious note of I'm releasing this music with intentions of touring or presenting it during a live show. It's undeniable that the likes of Gran Rodeo, Old Codex and Mamoru Mienu were responsible for turning it into something normal and now expected of seiyuu artists. Still, in the early stages of the last decade, only seiyuu artists that were really popular or counted with big sales numbers held live shows to wrap up the promotions of their music or, once again, as a thank you to their fans. Since 2018, as long as a seiyuu has sales numbers above 2000 copies, at least that's the trend I've noticed, they usually hold a live show or a tour to complement the promotions of their music. Holding a live show or tour is no longer something reserved for the really popular artists. At the same time, CU artists have learned to manage expectations and while there are ones booking massive arenas, there are others that prefer live houses for an even more intimate experience with their fans, at the expense of less people attending those live shows. Whereas others want a mix of mid-sized venues with a large one for their last stop on the tour. For example, reserved for live DVD and Blu-ray recording. Live tours and live shows are one of the most lucrative things for musicians in this digital era. With it being quite profitable for CU artists, it's no wonder that they are eager to hold live shows or tours. Some CU are actually really vocal about wanting to hold their first live show as soon as possible to build up momentum. Some make it a yearly thing or mix and match tours with one-off live shows to promote their music throughout the year. Of course, for live shows to happen, seiyuu artists need to have enough music in their repertoire. That's why rookie solo artists, usually with less than 16 songs to their name, have to wait until their third single and then their first full-length album to hold a live show or tour. Earlier than that is quite challenging to pull off a proper show, unless they will be playing new, unreleased music or covering music by other artists. Interestingly enough, as of late, 
Seiyu artists with very few songs to their name are holding live shows or headlining their live tours. That's what happened to Yumuchida for his live tour over the horizon, so Masaito with his live show Quantum Strangers and most recently with Makoto Furukawa's streaming Kinema from Fairy Tale. Let's analyze those three live shows. Suma Saito pulled off quite the unique feat for his Quantum Strangers live show. He played his entire discography during that live in 2019. It is a rare feat, as most Seiyu artists tend to hold their first live show or tour when they have enough music to choose from, instead of filling all 16 or 18 song spots in the setlist with… well, their entire discography. For those that watched the live show's DVD or Blu-ray, you may have noticed that Sacre Music chose the Maihama Amphitheater as the venue for the live. And that is a venue that doesn't work well for a live band setting, at least not the format Saito had going on, which was mostly stationary, nothing really happening besides five people playing the music in textbook fashion. It was simple, and that simplicity wasn't meant for that venue. It made it look like the artist was intentionally creating distance from his public, something that I always feel, as a fan and concert goer, makes it for an uncomfortable vibe to a live show. Not helping were the facts that the show was a one-off, no second day performances to make up for errors in the first day, and at the same time the live show was being recorded for a later DVD and Blu-ray release. He was performing his entire repertoire with no place for a surprise or two in the setlist. Saito went for a live show with only one full-length album and three singles released. And there was no room for mistakes. You could tell he was conscious about the fact that he couldn't make a mistake or it would be in the final version of the live DVD and Blu-ray. By the end of the live show, his face showed relief more than happiness, which is perfectly understandable. Somasaito's Quantum Strangers live, although rock solid, was insanely stiff. Waiting a bit longer to hold the live show, by adding more music to his repertoire, and holding it at a smaller venue, plus counting with back-to-back -back shows would have worked best for him. This thing about music labels wanting to rush their artists to have a live show, mixed with the Seiyu artists being a bit too eager to hold one, may not always translate into comfortable, fun and high-quality performances. In Saito's case, it made everything sound stiffer than you'd want for a first live show. At least, that's the feeling I got watching that live show. In contrast, Yumu Uchida held a live tour early in 2020. Over the Horizon was a solid tour, counting with a couple of stops that enabled him to build up his confidence and get more comfortable on stage. By the time he reached the final stop of the tour and its encore live, Yumu Uchida was one with the stage, smiling and overflowing with confidence. He had his room for mistakes in the first stops of the tour, perfected his performances and that helped deliver a solid encore live. He went for the Over the Horizon tour with four singles and one full-length album under his belt. There was already a bit of flexibility to the choices he could make for the tour setlist, however, it was still a rather predictable setlist. The fact that King Records decided that it was best to hold the tour ended up being time-consuming for Yumu Uchida, but at the same time was the perfect way to build up confidence, improve as an artist and just have fun on stage. When an artist is having fun on stage, it is infectious and fans can't help but to have fun as a result. 
so when you watch the live DVD of the live tour, you can't help but to feel the enjoyment he had with each performance. In this case, a live tour proved to be more effective in making the artist feel at home, something that increased the quality of the performances. Still, I feel like it was a bit too early to hold that live tour, as he couldn't make setlist rotations between tour stops to add variety or a unique touch to each day in that tour. Recently, Makoto Furukawa held his first live show. He made his solo debut in 2018 and, out of all seiyu that made their debuts as solo artists in the past 5 years, is the one that took the longest time to hold a live show. Still, in 3 years as a solo artist, Furukawa only counts with one full-length album and three singles under his belt. Are you starting to see that pattern that I was talking about a couple of minutes ago? One full-length album and three singles. That's the bare minimum to hold a live show nowadays. Back to what I was saying. Makoto Furukawa's Makoto Furukawa streaming Kinema from Fairytale is yet another example of a live show by a seiyu artist that has the bare minimum number of songs to be performed. Once again, is a seiyu artist with below 20 available songs to choose from for the live show's setlist. I haven't watched the online live so I can't talk about how the live show worked out in the end or how Furukawa adapted to the live show setting. If his past live performances at Orepara and most recently in a mini live to promote the release of From Fairy Tale are anything to go by, Furukawa is the most comfortable on stage out of the three seiyu artists I just mentioned. Still, I haven't watched the online live, so this is just me speculating based on previous live performances of his. If you've watched Makoto Furukawa streaming Kinema from Fairy Tale, please let me know in the comments how it was and just how comfortable he seemed on stage. This is something I'm really curious about. Well, Furukawa actually went for the live show with less than 16 songs in his name, so it is safe to say that he also performed his entire repertoire or a shorter set for that online live. As you can tell after these quick analyses, seiyu artists opting for a one-off live show or a tour really depends on a lot of factors. Primarily, it comes down to how comfortable they are on stage, how many songs they have in their repertoire, their schedules, how much money they want to earn. Live tours are extremely profitable, so if their schedules allow it, seiyu artists will aim for a live tour. One-off live shows are usually used as a showcase and usually generate less revenue than live tours. CU artists with packed schedules or less popular sales-wise may be more inclined to hold a one-off live show instead of a live tour. I haven't made any estimates of how profitable the tours or live shows mentioned earlier were, but you can expect Soma Saito and Yumuchida's live adventures to have earned them at least half a million dollars. Once again, having to attention that they do not receive that amount of money, they have to split it with a wide variety of interested parties. For more on that, I welcome you to check the previous 5 episodes. Online live shows apparently have earnings close to the on-location live shows because they allow for more people to attend it, as there are no venue capacity restrictions to hold into account. With Furukawa's online live being region locked, it only counted with Japanese fans in attendance and the occasional international fan using a VPN, so I wonder if it actually earned him a lot of money. Still, live tours and live shows are extremely profitable. The longer the tour and how frequently you hold the live shows, 
raises those earnings quite a lot. Most of the times bringing more money than their CD sales did. How many songs they have in their repertoire also affects the choice between one-off live show or a live tour. Say you artists with more music in their repertoire may be more inclined to hold a live tour because they can make set list rotations. Say you artists with a smaller repertoire may be more inclined to hold one-off live shows. Merchandising. Another common thing say you artists embrace to make their earnings soar is merchandise sales. These are closely tied to live performances, being almost like an appetizer to the performances or another part of the intimate experience that going to a live show or tour is. Say you artists selling pen lights with their artist color is something that is common and should I say expected? However, many already count with unique collections of merch that include unique unreleased artist photos, accessories, t-shirts, hoodies, pens, bags, pins, between many other things. Once again, a decade ago this was not common. As you can imagine, if a live show or tour are considered a premium experience, so is merchandise. especially merchandise that is exclusive to the live show or tour in question. Merchandise is another extremely lucrative part of being a CEO artist. Now you ask, but with live shows now being frequently held online, do say you earn a lot of money off of merchandise? Good question, they don't. Online live shows don't have that feeling of exclusive or intimate performance that on-location live shows have. Fans feel less inclined to purchase merchandise because, let's be honest, an online show is in no way the same as attending an on-location live. It isn't interactive, it isn't as exciting as being there watching the CU artist perform live. For example, in an interview to Reuters in 2020, AVEX's representatives mentioned that online live shows are more profitable than on-location live shows, much because of being open to fans worldwide. But they also confirmed that merch sales are in an all-time low. Thankfully, the fact that online live shows allow for more people, despite the tickets being cheaper, covers for the losses with low merch sales. So yeah, merch sales are high for on-location live shows and tours. Online live shows count with really poor merch sales numbers. Fashion brands. Sometimes connected to their careers as sayu artists, others just as a side job to voice acting and singing, Fashion brands are responsible for another slice of money. Kotaro Nishiyama, Yumuchida and Shugo Nakamura, for example, have merchandise lines of clothing and accessories linked to their music labels. Outside of their music labels and even talent agencies, Miuirinu and Soma Saito created their unique clothing and accessories in collaboration with Japanese apparel brands. Yoshiki Nakajima launched his own apparel brand. So why are Seiyu artists so obsessed with launching fashion or clothing brands? Because it brings in money from their hardcore fans as well as it can be an interesting way of making themselves known to people that wouldn't really come across them. Because, let's be honest, not everyone is a fan of Seiyu. Clothes and accessories are yet another part of the exclusive experience that fans seek off of their favorite Seiyu. There are fans that love to brag about owning the clothing or accessories their favorite Seiyu design. That's a lifestyle. Usually Seiyu count on those types of fans, the ones that are loaded and follow them like a cult, 
to purchase what they create, no matter how simple, easy to make or, in contrast, unique and complex those fashion items are. Are fashion brands a solid source of money for Seiyu artists? They can be, especially if the Seiyu in question are popular or have a dedicated following that is willing to part ways with their money in order to own a piece created or designed by them. Advertising and sponsorships Traditional advertising or collaborations are still not that common for Seiyu. For example, Mamoru Miyano did advertising for a cup ramen brand. Yumuchida has done advertising for Mitsubishi and Pokari. And Jun Fukuyama also did advertising for Mitsubishi. Now, if you go the digital advertising route, you have, for example, YouTube's monetization. While each video view generates royalties for the CU artist, there's another source of revenue there, and it comes from the ads that are served with each video. For example, with hundreds of thousands of views, some say you may earn much more money in ad revenue than they do earn royalties. Sponsorships are still not a thing among Seiyu. Looking at how the industry is evolving, it's a matter of time until Seiyu are as important as pop stars and then that's when brands start looking for them for endorsements. To sum it all up, Seiyu artists make money or additional money by performing music live, advertising or sponsorships, fashion brands and merchandising. It is interesting how there's not only much more to the music Seiyu artists release, but also many ways to complement the money they make with their music. So live tours or live shows, merchandise, fashion brands, advertising and sponsorships are the core ways in which Seiyu artists maximize their earnings or in which they make money that makes their careers in the music industry sustainable. All these complement their primary earnings with CD sales. In some cases, if not for those, some CEO artists wouldn't be making any money in their careers as solo artists. And why is that? Because you can't pirate the experience of attending a live show. You can't pirate an item that the CU artists are sponsored by or endorsing. You only have access to the clothes they design by purchasing those from them. And the merchandise is unique and in some cases limited edition. And this, my friends, is why CU artists have clothing brands or collaborations, why some tour or have live shows yearly sometimes more than twice in the same year. This is why there's always merchandise linked to their CDs being released or why they seek sponsorships and advertising or endorsements like their life depends on it. People can't steal those earnings from them. Exclusivity ends up being key for CU to make money. Now tell me, what do you think about Seiyu getting sponsorships or endorsing brands? While it's still not common, do you think it will turn into a trend in the future? Let me know in the comments below. And remember, leave your comments as complex or as simple as they may be and you can be featured on upcoming episodes of Seiyu Lounge. If you enjoyed this episode and don't want to miss the Hand at Feeds HQ's weekly mail Seiyu and music-related content, hit the subscribe button. I'll return next week with another episode of Seiyu Lounge. Thank you for listening and see you guys around.